How good. Surly back in the saddle, ready to rip and tear into the latest and greatest that is going on in the sporting world. Super Rugby final, State of Origin. Warriors, of course, heading across to the Gold Coast. She's another lip licker that we get dished up this weekend. Can't wait to chew the fat and cover off all the big topics going on. NBA finals, US Open. Shit, is there plenty to tuck into? Of course, shout out as always to the legends at the TAB. Really appreciate their support, so get around them. If you're not already a customer, sign yourself up, download their app, or head along to their website, www.tab.co.nz, and get yourself in the game. In terms of off-field antics last weekend, push the boat out in a major way, it's fair to say. Of course, Blakey Hall, shout out to your horse. 150th game for the coat, so we had to rip in for him. Got the win, Bet Silverdale did it pretty easily too. A massive game for us this weekend though coming up against Massey we win this one we secure a home semi-final which would be massive and we also lock up the Les Pierce Shield which is the Ranfurly Shield of North Harbour Club Rugby for the summer that would be scenes but post game last weekend of course dipped off at the after match to the Warriors then met back up with the lads after that this weekend looking to take her a little more easy although if the Chiefs get up in the final and the lads decide to stay up in Auckland for the night then maybe I'll find myself in the mixer kicking on with them shout out as well to better bear got to get around them 87 calories zero carbs she's the bear of sport always a day for it whenever better bear is in the mixer of course i'll have my better bear best performance of the week later on in the pod but without further ado let's get in kick her off talking all things the great game rugby league Round 15 in the books, and with that, of course, comes plenty talking points, as per usual. Add to that, State of Origin team's name for next Wednesday night's clash, and there is a lot of boxes to tick here. Let's start there with the Origin teams, and Madge Maguire, he's rolled the dice and made a couple of changes to this New South Wales team, and on paper, shit does this team have me excited. I actually think it's a lot more of a dangerous side than the one that took the field in Game 1. You'd have to think as well, This is probably Madge's preferred squad. Guys like Mitchie Moses, Dylan Edwards, Cam Murray. If they were all available for game one, I think they would have been wearing the sky blue. So that has me up and about. Like I touched on there, Dylan Edwards, the ghost, he gets the nod in the one jersey. Surely he's not doing extras this week, giving himself every opportunity to be out there on the paddock. Wrap yourself up in cotton wool horse and just get out there. Make your origin debut. Really excited to see him play. Of course, he's a high effort, high work rate player. Does have some raz about him. He's consistent as. You know you're going to punch out at least 200 metres at the back. Excited to see how he goes in this stage. He's played for the Kangaroos, but yet to debut in Origin. It's been a long time coming for the kid, and now he gets his chance. So keen to see him rip in on the wings. No changes there. Two of the best in the game in Brian To'o and Zaki Lomax, and they form a pretty deadly back three and a heck of a trio in the centres. Duo of doom. Stephen Crichton, arguably the best defensive centre in the game at the moment, and one of the best attacking threats as well. He's certainly a handful whenever he is dead in hand and then the big change in comes Traumit Dasa Mr. State of Origin Mr. Big Stage and I can't wait to see him back out there of course all the chat has been do we go with Trow do we not that suspension to Joseph Suwali he certainly forced Madge's hands a little more but at the same time the form he's been over the last couple of weeks has taken away any doubt that he is ready for this big stage jeez he just gives us such strike power out on that side and on his day he can be the best footballer in the game when he wants to when he's in a mood when his head is well and truly in it he's almost impossible to stop you can tell he's fired up he's looking forward to this occasion and I think it's going to be a vintage performance from Latrell to show that he is one of the best going round centers as well love that Hopefully we can get him one-on-one with Valentine Holmes because that bloke's been a turnstile as of late and I think Trail Mitt will well and truly have his way with him but we'll touch more on that shortly. In the Hards Drome, Luai keeps the six jersey, deservedly so too. His form as of late has been deadly and I also think his running game has been really underrated and with Latrell outside him on that edge, I think he's going to get a lot of opportunities here where Queensland will be more marking Latrell, opens up chances for Luai the show and go cheeky little whack and through he goes Mitchie Moses 
back, recovered from injury, played a couple of weeks of good football, and now he gets to wear the seven jersey. Tough on Nico. Back-to-back games now in Origin where he's had opportunities. Something hasn't quite gone his way. Came on in the 14 jersey for seven minutes in debut. That was bloody tough. Then, of course, game one down to 12 men. Straight away, it limits your chances. At the same time, I've zero doubt Madge, if Moses was available, would have had him in the seven for game one. His long kicking game is spot on. It's going to be crucial for us. Shit, did we miss that in the first game. He just carries this confidence about him that he is able to lead a team around the paddock. His ball playing strong, got a great running game. He's quick as fuck. So Mitchie Moe, excited to see how he goes. Then in the forward pack, just the one change to the run on side there. Robson, pain in the arse. And Jakey T, the thumbs up king, R skipper, all still there. The second rowers remain the same too. And Liam Martin and Angus Crichton. Then in the 13 jersey, Blue Eyes, Cam Murray back in the mixer and when he flutters those eyebrows at you no human could say no to this kid just the one game back for the bunnies but clearly Madge had seen enough to chuck him straight back in also do wonder if he was available for game one would he have been the skipper ahead of Jake Travojevic personally I think so but really excited to see Cam back out there then on the bench one big surprise here for me I didn't see this one coming Connor Watson but certainly deserved of course at the start of the year playing reserve grade didn't even make the Roosters 17 for the Vegas round he's been battling with injuries his career's been a real roller coaster heck of a footballer just couldn't consistently get out there week on week and bank that form that you need to play at state of origin well clearly Madge loves the cut of his jib he's a real utility can play hooker can play in the forward pack anywhere could play in the halves at a pinch he's a bit of a Dylan Walker type of operator almost and I'm excited to see how he goes incredibly good looking as well him and Cam Murray two great additions on the hot scale losing Joseph Suali that was a bit of a blow but then these two certainly boost us back up there Isaiah Yo, he keeps his spot he'll probably play in the middle and more of that propping role like he did in game one Molly Olakowatu and Spencer Lenu round out one of the scariest combinations off the bench in rugby league history two big bodies two aggressive if you run straight at them they'll fold you and then with nut in hand they prove to be a real handful and 18 our boy Mitch Barnett the Warnett just a bee's dick away from making his origin debut and personally on form I'd be chucking him in over Isaiah Yo at the moment and that's not to say Isaiah is out of form but I think Mitch is playing so well and if you're going to use Isaiah as a middle forward why not play a middle forward in that position that would be my question to Maj, you can understand though Zayo been a quality footballer and a leader for New South Wales for many years but I'd love to see a late change and Mitchie B get a crack shit is he just built for the origin stage and Jersey 19 Cam McInnes gotta feel a little sorry for him the toothless assassin he'll just tackle all day long when Nico Hines was dropped that probably really affected him that 13-7 combination no longer something for Madge to factor in and I just think Cam Murray too good of a footballer not to pick so it's tough shit for McInnes but still good to see him going round in the 20 and then speaking of the 20 this selection still puzzles me every time we make it but Luke Carey he makes the squad no room for Matty Burden I just really don't get this of course Carey he's retiring at the end of the year why not give the opportunity to a young up-and-comer Matt Burden certainly fits that mold can play in the halves can play in the centers could probably play in the pack if needed look he got dusted up by Dane Gagai a couple years ago so maybe Mads just said mate you can't throw him for shit I don't want you in my team at the same time as well maybe he's thinking if I'm not going to play him at all he's better off playing for the Bulldogs we don't want him not playing any footy this week but Luke Carey it's a real head scratcher for me surely there's some young up and coming New South Wales talent that we can chuck in the origin environment give them some experience he's literally not going to be in the game anymore next year so that 
doesn't make a shitload of sense. But like I touched on, overall, really like this blue side. I think in the additions of Trowel Mitt in particular, it gives us so much more strike. Really excited to see how Dylan Edwards goes alongside Cam Murray and Mitchie Moses too. Four great additions that I think make us a lot more of a handful. And the Queensland fans in my life, they seem a little bit more worried about this team on paper too. Then jumping across to Queensland, Billy Slater doing Billy Slater things. Made a couple changes. Changes. Hopgood, of course, out with injury. Selwyn Cobbo, is he dropped? Is he injured? They're saying he's been having pain-killing injections before playing. He was a bit of a hero in Game 1. Billy was saying you need a back on your bench in Origin. We always lose an outside back early doors. That's why he's in. He's now flipped that completely on his head. No back on the bench. Can't work this one out, to be honest. But hey, it is what it is. And I'm sure you Queenslanders, you're not stressing too much because every decision that Billy makes always seems to turn into gold. But at the back... Reese Walsh, he is back in the mixer, recovered from brain cell depletion, and he will go again in the one jersey. No doubt the Blues will look to target him, but at the same time, I think Walsh will be fired up to put in a heck of a performance, make up for lost time, so we certainly have to be wary of him. Xavier Coates and Ty Lungi, no changes there. Valentine, the turnstile alongside the Hammer in the centres, and that Crichton versus Hammer matchup, that one is going to be interesting too. The Hammer, we saw on the weekend with that try he scored for the Dolphins, one of the game's elite attacking threats. Critter, known for his work on defence. Those two going at it for 80 minutes head to head. Sign me up for that. Tommy Dearden and DCE, the people's neck in the halves, with Paddy Carrigan, Sua. Cotter, Hunt and Lindsay Collins all in the Ford pack so no changes there. Harry Grant Big Mo, Felice Kafusi, and then Kirk Capewell onto the bench with an extended of Origin gags. Helam Lukey, the Helium Balloon and young Trent Leroux from the Melbourne Storm to round us out. Curdy Capes in 17. Didn't see that one coming and for me this was a bit of a selection from the clouds. At the same time though, he's been there before, he's done a job for Billy and I know that Slater certainly trusts him. He also gives you that utility value, could play centre at a pinch, he's done it before there. So when he decided Cobbo wasn't up to it, Capewell was probably one of the first names to come to mind. Backing the experienced head, only 20 minutes for the Warriors off the bench on the weekend so I thought that might have ruled him out. But hey, Billy the bush poet he knows what he wants and he's gone with Curdy Capewell which you love to see as a Warriors fan cool to have some representation back in the mix of course this game going down next Wednesday night in Melbourne huge fizz for that the Blues we have to win it otherwise I think we'll get swept you can't rock up to Suncorp down 2-0 and expect to not walk away with a pants down hiding all or nothing for us we'll have to fight for everything and we've got to show up with the right intent but I truly do believe this team better pick side 1 to 17 than the one in game one and I think we'll come away with a win in a close one force the decider at Suncorp can't wait for State of O next Wednesday night and speaking of State of O plenty of chat around the game potentially coming to New Zealand and Eden Park in 2027 I'm all for it fair to say the comments on my post when I chucked her up about this news they were pretty divided to be fair which caught me off guard a little I thought the rugby league purists here would certainly get around it the rumors is 2027 Auckland Council though they have to get this one past the Eden Park Residence Committee or some bullshit like that those people that live around the stadium that complain about events late at night and the noise if you choose to live next to a stadium that's something you've got to cop and I never quite understand that argument it always seems to cost us opportunities to have big events whether it's concerts or sporting events but that is a rant for another day. In terms of bringing this game to New Zealand, I'd love to see it. A, from a selfish point of view, I really want to go to a state of origin game, and I do understand the argument around origin being an Australian spectacle, New South Wales versus Queensland, why take it out of there? My argument back to that is... If the games were only played in New South Wales or Queensland, I would be all for it. But the fact
fact they're taking games to Melbourne, Perth, Adelaide, you can't tell me that there wouldn't be more rugby league fans in New Zealand than there are in those regions. I think Eden Park would sell out in a split second. And while there's not Kiwi players on the paddock, at the same time, it would do wonders for the game. Of course, rugby league currently winning the arm wrestle with rugby union here in New Zealand. And while our players watching in the stands are young up and comers, wouldn't be eligible to play in this game, you can still ignite that fire inside you to think, shit, I want to play rugby league. These are the big stages I want to be playing on. Chuck a Kiwis versus Tonga test match either before or after that game. It would probably have to be before, to be fair, due to the late kickoff it would be. It would be about a nine o'clock kickoff to align with the Australian TV times. So chuck the Kiwis on beforehand. Make it that rep round that the NRL have been flirting with for a long time. I think the buy-in from the New Zealand Rugby League public would be massive and I'd certainly be in the queue to get my ticket to that. I would be surprised if it didn't sell out in under five to ten minutes. I think the support for a game here would be ginormous. So watch this space and hopefully it can happen 2027. I'd be all over that. In terms of your NRL news, plenty going down as well. Rumours Dylan Brown wants out of his contract for 2026 at Parramatta. And the first team that seems to be floating around to be interested is the Warriors. And of course, this is pure speculation. At the same time though, if he was to become available, would we want to have him? Personally, for me, I'd absolutely say yes. Current Kiwi 6, an attacking threat, one of the game's characters too. He's a Northland boy, a proud Kiwi, so it's always great to bring home some of our homegrown talent. 2026, you'd have to assume SJ certainly isn't there. Tamari Martin, Metcalf, Chanel, Harris, Tavita, that would be our halves. Pair him up with either Metcalf or T at 7, and I think you've got yourself an elite combination there at the same time lots of young talent coming through Luke Henson and then we've signed Jet Cleary from next year as well so do we need more halves you could argue no but I think when a player of Dylan Brown's quality comes up on the market you just have to chuck your name in the hat so again pure speculation Warriors fans don't take this as gospel these are just your internet rumors social media and whatnot but plenty of chat Brown wants out from Parramatta in the years to come could we see him at Mount Smart running out of the tunnel I personally think it would be a great signing Carter Gordon speaking of great signings the Wallabies first five he is off to apply his trade on the Gold Coast a great get for the GC lads assuming he will fill that vacant role in the halves that they've really been struggling to fill long term at the moment they got guys like Tanner Boy Jaden Campbell playing there as well purely just to accommodate the amount of fullbacks that they have in their roster but I think Carter Gordon has that potential to be one of their long term halves he's an extremely talented footballer if you haven't seen much of him play don't watch the 15 man code bit of a bigger body he was a first five loves running the ball strong kicking game good distribution a bit of a leader as well he's someone the Wallabies certainly wouldn't have wanted to lose and no doubt Australian rugby are pretty gutted about this alongside Mark Nawanga Netoase who is going across to the Roosters next year They've lost two of their big, young, up-and-coming talents, and this Carter Gordon one in particular really would sting. So well done to the Titans. Excited to see how he goes in league, and maybe this creates even more of a ripple effect. I want to see some Kiwi players do this move too. For so long it's been rumoured, no one has exactly pulled the trigger, so maybe that starts things off there. Damien Cook, he's off, leaving the Bunnies, announced this morning. Of course, I record this on a Wednesday. He's departing, going back to the club which handed him his debut where it all started in the Dragons when I first heard this news I was a little bit gutted wanted him to stay at the Bunnies he's been there for so long now become a legend at South Sydney but once you remind yourself he did debut for the Red V then it's almost a bit iconic a homecoming for the kid there was a bit of chat as well around a potential player swap for Jack DeBellin so keep an eye out for that one I think that'll be a really good move for both clubs Bunnies they always need numbers in their Ford pack Red V they certainly need a hooker the old Dargons and in Cook pairing him up with Benny Hunt 
two veterans, but they're both rep level players, both amongst the top five to ten in their position in the comp. So things are starting to look up for the Dargons, and they could well be a decent football side next year. In terms of your big results from last week, let's rip into those now. Of course, we had the Finns getting the win, 30 points to 28 on your Thursday night footy over the Sharkies. The Dolphins' first win in Sydney as a franchise in the NRL. So well done to them there. It was a pretty gutsy win to the Hammer. Try of the year contender. Bloke went the length of the field, 100 metres. As soon as they kicked it to him and Trindle missed that first up tackle, the writing was on the wall there. You could tell he was was going to make them pay. Such a pleasure to watch on the eyes. The bloke is a true freak. It's not just his elite speed, but the way he moves and his ability to change direction. It's more of a swerve than a step, but he doesn't appear to lose too much speed either while he does it. He's truly magical on his feet and a massive result there for the Finns to keep themselves in the top four. And it's another cross on the Sharkies book. Still can't work them out. Sitting in third, though, so perhaps that is a little harsh. We had the Bunnies beating the Broncos. They're really starting to fire now. They lose a few to Origin this week. Some of their best players, too. But at the same time, they'll still have your Jack Widens, your Cody Walkers, your Colin Matangis. So plenty of strike in that team. They're starting to string some wins together now. Sitting in four teams on the ladder. Broncos will be bloody disappointed with that shift and perhaps there's a few Bronx fans in Brisbane starting to get a little nervous now because over the last month they've been a bit up and down really missing Adam Reynolds suffered a pretty major injury and there's no guarantees that he will be back and to 100% in the near future but they're starting to show some cracks sitting in ninth on the ladder. Perhaps the depth in the squad isn't as deep as it was over the last couple years and now we're starting to see that but the bunnies though they really do become an interesting proposition can they push to make the eight their form over the last couple weeks certainly suggests so they can't afford to drop many more games at the same time you look ahead to their next five clashes they got manly this week then they got Parramatta origin boys backing up you probably back them in there dolphins in redcliffe never easy but They'll probably go in as favourites for that one too. Then they've got the Tigers and the Raiders. There's well and truly a world there where they win the next five on the trot and then they will well and truly be entrenched and back in the playoff mixer. Then Tigers, they win the Wooden Spoon Bowl. A huge dub for them to snap a 10-game losing streak off the back of a huge performance from Stefano Uto Ikamanu. Unfortunately for the Titans, geez, they just can't string it all together, can they? Some weeks they look so solid. Some weeks they look like dog shit. This was the latter for them. No David Fafita, Chicken Fajita, who was a late pull out with that ankle. And again, interesting to see him not in the Queensland 20 at all. Clearly Billy Slater is well and truly off him. I thought Keanu Keeney was outstanding in the fullback role. Been shouting him out a bit lately. Of course, Rosmini X product from the North Shore, but he had 318 run meters off 26 runs, three line breaks and nine tackle breaks. This team has so many good fullbacks. Campbell, Brimson when he's healthy, Keanu, Keeney. They're much like the Knights for me. Absolutely stacked in the one jersey, but they've got to find a way to make them all fit. Because at the moment, when they've tried to play all three, it certainly hasn't worked. Headaches there for Des Hasler, and hopefully the Warriors can pile on the hurt even more this week. Was relief for Benji, though. Happy to see them get the dub. Now sitting in second to last on points for and against above the Titans by two points so a real bees dick but if they can avoid the spoon here then that's almost a successful season for them as they continue their rebuild and great to hear Lockie Galvin he won't be leaving either old Galvin Klein and him and Luai Taruva geez there's some potential there in years to come if they can just get everything right there at the West Tigers then moving on to the Warriors review and I know a lot of you tune in purely just to hear my thoughts on this one a tough night for the boys at the office in front of a sold out fortress at the same time though plenty of positives to take from that one and this was a loss that hurt a little but I think it stings even more because of a few factors which played its part that were well and truly out of our control so overall it wasn't our night first 20 minutes of the game though we looked so dominant and for patches throughout this contest I thought we looked unreal really pleasing to see our left edge attack firing on short side plays in particular Pompey 
Pompey, Montoya, Barnett, they contributed to all of our points. Four tries between the three of them. Pompey again, dead eye off the rubber. And great to see this from us because it hasn't been a strength of our game, that short side attack. And it's hardly like we had numbers on the Storm that defended it evenly. But overcall, Wade Egan playing down the short, often straight to Mitchie Barnett, which you love to see from our second rower, putting his hand up and it leading to tries. That CNK flick pass for Montoya's first try, that was a thing of beauty. Benji Marshall would be proud of that one. Chance, he does have a bit of razzle about him so often. I call him Mr. Reliable, Mr. Safer's Houses. You bunch him in that group of just a metre eater, never makes errors, so consistent. But he's got a nice whack, got some nice footwork and he showed off his skill set here with that flick ball of doom under pressure defender rushing up on him to pull off a clutch play like that was truly elite defensively I thought the lads were locked in too we consistently dominated the collision and drove the Melbourne Storm players back I think last year we noticed a massive shift in the Warriors defensive intent but that was mainly around the wrestle winning that using leg hooks sweeps and things like that to get opposition players on their back dominate the collision by some extra time down below we've seen referees crack down more on those type of techniques this year unless you're playing for the Melbourne Storm I'll touch on that shortly but overall refs they've been quick to call six agains whenever they see players trying things like that so instead we've adapted we've decided to hit a bit higher in numbers and drive players back the crowd visit they get around it and it seems every time your Mitch Barnett's your Maratania Kore's whenever they are in a collision the opposition ball runner gets sent on a treadmill backwards which really does fire up the lads Jerome Hughes thought he was outstanding for the storm love him in a Kiwis jersey but man does he hurt us in a storm jersey putting on a clinic in the seven like he always does against us he really does come back to bite us in the ass. he's one of the best halves going around in the comp for me often so underrated but when you think of form sevens this year he has to be a pick the old he get assassin I thought X warrior Ali Kator was a nightmare too great from a fantasy team but sucks for us one of those guys that you could argue got away but at the same time we're so stacked for second rowers and it just seemed like we weren't going to be able to get the best out of Ali. Now that was under the old regime. I would love to see what Webby could have perhaps done with him. At the same time it's great to see him going good guns over there having an outstanding year. That strip he pulled off on Adam Pompey was really heads up stuff. He's becoming a smart footballer and his combination with Hughes is becoming one of the great half second row strike options in the NRL then Farlongo thought he killed us as well obviously scored two tries you could call him Dominic Toretto because he's fast and he is furious thought he injured himself on that swan dive and for me that would have been quite satisfying I hate when players do shit like that especially in front of a packed south stand he certainly added some GST to that meaty landed on the ball looked like he'd done some damage to his rib or maybe even his shoulder but he recovered from it and turned on another try later on in the second half in terms of standouts for us it was an interesting game for me and I don't actually really have many to highlight just on an individual level of course Barnett, Marata, Chans, guys like that all put their hands up as they always do we won lots of crucial errors of this game especially when you look at the stats completion rate total run meters we had twice as many tackle breaks as them PCMs we almost doubled them there offloads we killed them only 26 missed tackles compared to their 45. If you said that heading into the game and against the majority of other teams, I would have 100% said we win this game. The Storm though, they just always find a way. And I mentioned before that refereeing, got a real bee in my bonnet about this because I thought the display that we saw on Saturday certainly wasn't good enough and it's copping a lot of criticism from Warriors fans and fair enough to some shockers in there and the shit that Melbourne were able to get away with in the ruck slowing down our play the balls and manipulating where we had to attack that was crazy and full credit to them they find a way to get away with it and if the refs are going to allow it then you're certainly going to continue to do it for the first 20 minutes I thought the ref was dialed in, bang on, six agains, shutting it down. But then after that, really appeared to put his whistle away and I couldn't quite understand it. They were crowding the ruck, they were getting their feet and arms tangled up in every 
play the ball. Instead of taking us to the ground, they just prefer to stand us up, act like they're trying to get out of the way, but at the same time, they're just throwing their limbs in there to really slow things down. Then the last man out of the tackle, he was crowding Wade, showing him only one option to play, and it was always to the way that they had numbers on in defence. There were several opportunities there where I thought we could have gone left, but their second player in the tackle would block off that option, meaning our hand was forced, we had to go right. The fact the ref wasn't picking up on this really did piss me off too. It should have been six again, City. Then you get to that Wade Egan penalty. That absolutely was a penalty. The fact he was bleeding from the mouth was a great indication alone that he had copped a high shot, a swinging arm across the chops. Then add to that, you have Jerome Hughes calling for him to go off for an HIA. If it wasn't a penalty, then why would he need to go off for an HIA? Clearly there was direct head contact there and I thought the bunker and the referee dropped the ball on that one. The cherry on top for me though was that Jerome Hughes penalty on his kick with the old Kung Fu Panda move, kicking his leg out late to initiate contact with Jackson Ford. There's not a lot he could do to get himself out of the way. I'm all for protecting the kicker but it's almost gone too far now and they're becoming a protected species like the quarterback. If the kicker is willing to initiate contact then that should absolutely be play on for me. It's piggyback penalties like that that really hurt us, ruled out all our momentum in this game. It's hard enough to beat the storm when you're on a level playing field, let alone when the referees are against you. So there were a few calls in there that were really tough to swallow. And I thought in the end, it robbed us of an opportunity to compete to the level like we would have liked to, especially after that hot start where the ref looked like he was calling it down the middle to then put the whistle away and let all of those instances go unpenalised. Bloody frustrating stuff. A few injuries, few Sinbins certainly didn't help either. Found it interesting that Walks went into centre for that Rocco injury. I thought Capewell or Chanel harris Tavita certainly would have gone on there and I thought we missed Walks' impact through the middle as a result. Thought Chanel's impact off the bench was great. Would love to see us use him more. He's got a bit of that X factor about him off the Remu. So hopefully that's something Webby looks to adjust in the weeks to come. And speaking of weeks to come, let's rip into this week. Week. That was a long NRL segment, so bear with me though, plenty to cover off. No game tonight, State of Origin of course, which means we get dished up a compressed round. She's by City, lots of teams getting the opportunity to rest the rig. So Friday night footy, that's our first game to crack into. Finns taking on the Storm, going to be an interesting one this one. It's in Brisbane, so straight away that boosts Redcliffe's chances, although of course they are down troops. The Storm, they get Pappy back. Fa'alongo moves into the wing, so dual attacking threats there. No Harry Grant, no Xavier Coates, but the brick, fully bricked up. William Warbrick back in the mixer too. For the Finns, Felice Kafusi. He's out. Jesse Bromwich returns from injury though, so that's almost a like-for-like -like swap. And then interesting to see Tavita Pangai Jr. named on the bench to make his NRL return. One of the great professional boxing careers decided that getting punched in the face wasn't for him. And I'm interested to see if he's going to listen to the directions of his young half in Ali Katoa or if he's just going to choose to ignore them. That was his downfall in previous clubs. Didn't want to be told what to do. So let's see how TPJ goes. That could be one of the great mid-season additions for him. If they get him fired up, big body, loves the physical stuff, aggressive ball runner, and he could help add some massive punch to this Dolphins pack. Then on your Saturday night, of course, Titans Wars tuck into that more shortly. Roosters versus Dogs, looking forward to that one. Bunnies versus Eagles, that should be a great clash too. And then on Sunday, Tigers versus Raiders, 6.05. A bit of a poo slinger for your Sunday roast, but your best believe leave. I'll still be watching that one. Dusty on the couch. So Warriors Titans this week. Looking forward to this game. 5pm kickoff on the Gold Coast. It doesn't get much better than that. Sun's predicted to be out. Should be great conditions for running rugby football. And we owe these blokes after that Anzac Day boil over. So hopefully the lads are heading over. Fired up 
ready to rip and tear and put on a 13 plus victory titans just the three wins this year but they certainly can't be underestimated they're coming dead last but they seem like one of those teams that always come back to bite us and if we're being fair dinkum we really do need to come away from this one with the two points before heading back home next week heritage round wearing that beautiful jersey to take on the broncos for des hasler's side david fafita comes back in hate to see that that. What a threat he is going to be. Khalees Haas, he drops out of the side. Actually thought he was decent last week, to be fair. Aaron Clark, ex-Warrior, in the locking jersey. They lose Big Mo to Origin, so that is a big tick. And then Joey Stimson and Fasor Malawi on the bench, but breathe a sigh of relief because it's not Tino. It's his younger brother, who's still decent, but certainly not of the same calibre. Then for the Waz, changes are plenty from the side that got beaten by the Storm all forced either by origin or injury but I still think 1 to 17 this is a bloody exciting team for us chance nickel clock start at the back Montoya on the wing run of the mill stuff big Ed Cossey gets his opportunity which I perhaps was a little surprised at thought we might have seen Roger who is of course back and playing in the centres but I thought he might have featured on the wing Moala Graham Tulfa in the centres instead Webby's gone with big cost man and in we be we trust Roger, like I touched on, recovered from his hamster strain and he is back excited to see how he goes, in particular on that left side now which seems to be getting a whole lot more ball him on a short side with his footwork and ball playing ability that could prove to be deadly Adam Pompey, he keeps his centre role as he should, Tamare Martin and Sean Johnson again in the halves, in terms of a duo, didn't quite click last week and I was big on last week's pod saying that SJ would make all of you haters pay wasn't quite the performance that I had scripted for him at the same time though first week back in the saddle the storm made him get through a shit ton of work defensively I think he made 28 tackles no doubt the tank was gassed would love to see him vary up his fifth tackle kicking options that is a critique of him that I can certainly cop but I think week two of this combination and we will see things click and work a whole lot better then in the forward pack couple changes here Tohu he gets the run starting at lock interesting to see if there will be a late shift here again. For Noah Blake, Jacko Ford, Egan, they continue to be the trio up front. Second rows is where it gets interesting for me though. Marata Neil Kore and Walks in the 12. For me, our game plan has been so effective over the last couple of weeks, having big bodies in the second row to give us that punch, run aggressive downlines and just stop defenders in their tracks. Walks, not the biggest body, still an aggressive ball runner with fast foot speed, but personally I'd prefer to see him in the 13 jersey and perhaps go with a Laban or even a Jackson Ford moving back to the second row start someone else at prop but in Webby we trust Chanel Harris-Tavita in the 14 Jacob Laban in the 15 Jazz Tavanga in the 16 Tommy Ale in the 17 pretty harsh on Bunty I thought he might have been a chance to start at prop this week but he wears the 18 Tain Tuopiki, Moala Graham Tolfa, Freddie Lussick and then in 23 and this is really exciting purely for the fact that I don't think he's a chance to play but it's great to see him named on an extended bench one of the true young talents coming through through the club he's going to be a household name for Warriors fans in the years to come Leka Halasima still only 19 years old coming back from injuries been playing bloody good football though in the cup side and he is a real rugby league handful has all the skills that you want for a star second rower think of a Jeremiah Nunai type of of ball player great in the air as well and he is going to be someone that will fill up the team sheet for many years to come again don't think he's a chance to force his way into this team but I wouldn't be surprised at the same time if there are a couple late changes here because I'm not a hundred percent sold that, that Ford pack will be the one that runs out in those positions anyway but overall a massive opportunity here for us to go over to the Gold Coast right our wrongs from Anzac Day and come away with the two points on paper we should be too strong for this tight side but they're also a team that you can never underestimate or take lightly despite their position on the ladder go get the job done dominate through the middle implement our attacking shape and keep that defensive mindset that we've had over the last couple of weeks yes we conceded 38 points last week but the majority of their points came off fifth tackle and them scoring off their kicks so if we can lock down the middle 
restrict the Titans to limited try scoring opportunities, really fire up whenever Fafida, Campbell, Keeney get the ball, limit the penalty count and the errors. I can't see why we don't come away with this one with an emphatic victory. Add to that, Gold Coast, plenty of Warriors fans there have no doubt this one is going to sound like a home game. So get out there, support the boys, Warriors 13 plus, and you know the drill. So should be another huge round of the NRL heading into State of O next week. Bloody good stuff. How good is God's game? And get up, the mighty one New Zealand Warriors. Super Rugby and the cream of the crop advance to the big dance and I can't think of a better matchup, a real blockbuster to have for your grand final. Two sides from the top of the North Island, close rivals that whenever they play each other it's always a great spectacle and now they get a chance to go at it, to lift the Super Rugby title. Blues chasing their first one in 21 years the Chiefs chasing their first in 11. So much to play for for both of these sides. Before we get into that though, do have to kick things off here with your rugby on a bit of a somber note and my thoughts and prayers go out to the family friends and teammates of Connor Garden Bishop. Such a tragedy this was of course unfortunately he passed away during the week due to a medical event. Such a young lad with still so much of his footy career and life ahead of him. Incredibly sad to hear of the news of his passing. I didn't believe it when I first heard it. Seemed like a great bloke too. One that all his teammates spoke so highly about about, really did help drive the culture down there in Landers territory was off contract with them and I believe he'd picked up a gig overseas so incredibly sad, heartbreaking stuff and it really does just go to show how fragile life can be never take any day for granted because anyone could be your last but again thoughts, prayers and love go out to Connor's family, friends and teammates, this one really did hurt seeing this news and fingers crossed everyone's doing as well as could be in such a sad situation but on to your Super Rugby semi-final reviews and we'll kick her off with the Blues getting the Chockeys at home and for me this game was over fairly early doors you could tell the Blues were on another level compared to the Brumbies who didn't quit and tried their best for the full 80 minutes but the Blues just dominated this contest 24 points to 6 after 20 minutes the queue was in the rack there and the Brumbies they just don't have the attacking threats to be able to peg back a scoreline like that. Home side just too many weapons they dominated from the outset and they were deserved winners I thought Hoskins was great tied the super rugby record for tries scored by a forward in a season with 12 and I think he's the first non-hooker to score that many as well the dude is an absolute beast AJ Lamb I think he's proving to be a handy 12 too had seen him play a bit of centre of course normally he's on the wing for Auckland and for the Blues but he's showing his utility value previously I just had him down as a big body, a strong ball runner but he's actually got a bit of a distribution game about him too and when Bryce Heen went down injured it certainly opened up opportunities for others straight away I thought Corey Evans would probably be the first cab off the rank but AJ's really put his hand up there and made that 12 jersey his own which you love to see, I thought Caleb Clark was outstanding yet again had a great super rugby season turning into one of their great attacking weapons kind of bringing back that form from a couple years ago when he first burned burst on the scene and earned himself an AB's jersey and then also summon a shout out from the four pack alongside the Hoss I thought Ricky Riccatelli was outstanding in the hooking role, his work at set piece was really sharp, line outs looked great and then defensively I thought he got it through a truckload of the tough stuff around the rucks Ricky Riccatelli not exactly a household name, he's been battling away in New Zealand rugby for a long time now he's been given that starting two jersey though at the Blues and I think he's going great Great guns. He's proved to be a key part of that four pack, which really is humming at the moment. Fair to say the crowd was disappointing for this game. I went along to it. I think a lot of that had to come down A to the weather forecast. They were putting out heavy rain warnings. Turned out the night was actually quite nice but I think that scared off a few punters and then at the same time let's be honest, these Aussie teams they don't draw the same crowds as a derby game does. I think if that was Blues versus Chiefs, Blues versus Hurricanes Blues versus Crusaders in a semi-final, they would have got at least twenty to 25,000 along for that one. The fact that was the Brums 
In fact, the Blues were heavy favourites to win that. I think many people just thought they'd watch it from the comfort of their couch. At the same time, though, a game as high stakes as a semi-final, you'd hope that stands were at least semi-full because it really was a bit of a desert town. The crowd, though, they took entertainment into their own hands. Like I said, the game was done early doors. The win was already almost chalked up. If you didn't see my videos on social media, Ligma Balls and Small Balls, they were running a muck on the old Samsung sung smart TVs across Eden Park. There's about 50 of them in that north stand for people to watch those if they can't see the big screen so they don't miss a moment of the action. Turns out someone, the powers that be at Eden Park, hadn't turned off the Bluetooth on these TVs. So a couple crafty fellas, they were out there with their phones looking to connect via Bluetooth, changed their name to Ligma Balls and Small Balls, which was eyes up footy there. I managed to film it. The clip's gone pretty viral over 1.2 million views across my Facebook and Insta so shout out to whoever that was you've done your mate Surly a favour content wise and I'll be interested to see if there's a few more larrikins out there at the final this week looking to replicate it and go again I'm sitting in a very similar spot so I'll be keeping an eye out for that maybe Sugma Balls and Micro Penis will be in the mix this week I'll keep you posted as always I'll have the phone out ready to snap it if it does pop up but shout out to those two running a muck on the old Samsung Smart TVs at Eden Park. Some real eyes up footy there, and they added another entertainment factor to this occasion. It is fair to say. Your second semi-final... This one was more bums on seats, but much like the first one, you could say the game was over in the first 20 minutes. The Chiefs, they pulled off the upset, the mana shone on through, but this was a total domination right from the onset, and the damage was done early doors. First half, the Chiefs were all over them. It could have easily been 31 points to 7 at half time. Two disallowed tries straight away. Gotta say that Sam Penny female Sinbin for me was an absolute crock of shit. TJ could apply for a job at Fonterra the way he milked that one. I don't think that was Sinbin worthy at all. Perhaps a penalty even there. I thought it was a bit of a stretch. Rugby, much like rugby league, really does need to look into that rule. But the Chiefs for me, just so physical. Really did dominate the breakdown area. Made the most of their opportunities. When it turns into broken rugby, they're such a dangerous football side. Their back three, regardless of a shooter's there or if he's not. Daniel Ronick came in on the wing and then it's in there to full back but all three of them elite on their feet great strike weapons D-Mac he loves playing that broken footy as does Leonard Brown and then that forward pack really did just roll up the sleeves and go out there with an intent to hurt and batter this Canes pack like we saw them do the week before against the Reds and unfortunately for the Canes I think they were just well off the mark probably their most disappointing performance so far you do have to wonder a bit of a lack of experience in amongst that pack. Perhaps they peaked too early. At the same time, I think most of the credit has to go to the Chiefs though, because I think they came down with a real intent, a game plan, and they just executed it perfectly. Took the game away from the Canes and ended their season early, which is probably tough to swallow for Swirls fans because they've been the best team all year. But hey, that's the joys of finals football. One shot, you don't show up, you're gone. Off to the beach for the summer, and that's the way it is for the lads from the capital. In terms of your standouts, Wallace Satiti, absolutely outstanding. And he was my better bear, best performance of the week. 17 carries for 146 metres, three huge runs, two leading to tries, one leading to a disallowed try too, which was a pretty tough call. The fact he's only 21 years old is pretty wild. He's gone from club footy last year to MPC, Super Rugby, and now dominating on the Super Rugby stage too, and potentially playing his way into All Black selection. To me, he seems like a player who just rises to whatever level he's playing at. He's one of those rare talents who has the size, has the speed, has that strong skill set and a unique composure for a young lad. He plays well above his age, that's for sure. Sets up a mouth-watering battle this week up against Hoskins Satutu in the 8 jersey and I've no doubt Razor will be watching that match up closely because whoever plays better out of those two could well end up wearing the number 8 jersey come July in those tests against England. I thought Damian McKenzie was outstanding again. What a year for him. Certainly claimed the 10 jersey for the ABs and 
he really turned it on. He was the difference for me in this game. Up against Brett Cameron, mentioned it was a big battle. Could Cameron play his way into All Black selection? For me, D-Mac just dominated him in every aspect. He was great off the tee. His tactical kicking was good. And then broken play, his attack was outstanding. What a shift from that fella. Got to say, great header here on him at the moment too. Rumours he's done the Izzy Dag, went over to Melbourne earlier in the year. But I'll let you guys make your own mind up on that one. Then also in the back line, I thought Imani Narawa, he was an absolute gun. Just one of those freakish players that he can do shit you don't think is humanely possible. He's got that Fijian flair about him, carrying the ball in one hand, cheeky little netball pass. That try set up for Sam Apeni Finau was just elite one-on-one -on -one individual brilliance and I'm really excited to see him play for the All Blacks this year I think at the World Cup he's one of those players we really miss gives us unreal strike and X factor can create something out of nothing and his performance on the weekend was huge there so on to the final we go and like I said the stage is set write a better script a rivalry game battle of the Bombays winner claims Pocono Blues they've had a long drought since 2003 the Chiefs they're changing Facing their first title since 2013. A new Super Rugby champion will be crowned for the first time since the Hurricanes lifted the trophy in 2016. Crazy to think. Crusaders have won the last seven on the bounce, but they've already called their season a couple weeks ago. So I'm excited for something a bit different there. Clearly the fans are excited too, the rugby public, because the Garden of Eden sold out in just a matter of hours, 44,000 tickets sold. Can't wait to be at this game. I think this atmosphere is going to be unreal. Anytime you rock up to a final, there's always that sense of nerves. Everyone's on edge. The crowd buys into the occasion. Everyone rides every decision. And I think this game is going to be one that really does live up to the hype. I'm expecting it to be tight. Two physical forward packs and both back lines stacked with Razzle, especially out wide. Shooter, he's good to go. I believe he'll be out there for this one. Made the unselfish decision last week that he wasn't at 100%, so decided to let someone else go out there and represent the jersey. But I believe he'll be lacing up this week, so excited for that. By the time you guys hear this pod, the teams will be named, so you'll have a better indication. And interesting too, I was talking to Jeff Wilson earlier today, and he mentioned that Patrick Tuipolotu has been at Blues training and running as well, which would be a huge huge turnaround if he's even a small possibility to play in this game even 20 minutes off the bench or just chucking him in the team for his leadership alone let alone his game playability that'll be a massive boost for the Blues so maybe Goldie that was a bit of a stretch there just having him back for the All Blacks would be good but if Paddy T is able to lace up what a recovery from injury that would be and surely he's been over to Fiji to get the old Naholo treatment because that would be an insane turnaround from a guy who was expected to be out for about eight to ten weeks so keep an eye out for that one speaking of injuries unfortunate for the Chiefs no Talki Aho, so in will come Tyrone Thompson but he is a more than capable replacement a quality footballer set piece is going to be huge for me and I think the Blues will be licking their lips at the thought of no Samasone just because of how strong he is at both line out and scrum time let alone his ability to ball carry the Blues they've been so strong at set piece this year and for me they're going to want to play a lot of that type of rugby whereas the Chiefs they're going to want to go for ball and play speed this one up broken play footy and turn it into an arm wrestle that way two slightly contrasting styles but both teams have the ability to play the other team's style as well which I think makes this a bloody hard outcome to predict in terms of your matchups heaps of those across the paddock too which I think will play a big part into all black selection and the loose forwards you got that Chiefs trio who bullied the Canes but I'm not sure they'll be able to do that up against Akira Hoskins and Dalton who are far more experienced at finals footy and really do live for those physical battles then Finlay up against Cortez Ratama no doubt Razor keeping a close eye there Anton Leonard Brown up against Rico Ioani two great all black locking horns Talia Clark Perifeta 
up against Etene Emone and Shooter. Shit, that's almost an overdose of Razzle. For me though, gun to head if you ask me to predict a winner from this one. I think the Chiefs are going to grind this out and get the job done in a bloody close game. And the reason I say that, the difference maker for me has to be in the 10 jersey in Damian McKenzie. Full credit to Harry Plummer. He's been outstanding this year. The jack of all trades, the tradey old plumber. But I think D-Mac is another step above. And when these games are so tight, the deciding factor in my head always comes down to when the game is on the line, who do I want with the Gilbert in hand? Making the big calls, kicking the big goals, making the big plays. And for me, that's Damian McKenzie in this game. His form has been elite so far this year. And I trust him to guide this Chiefs side home. I also think they'll be stinging off the back of that finals loss last year. This team deserves a championship. And I think they're going to come up, make the trick up the highway and pull off the upset paying juicy odds at the TAB too. So looking forward to this game. Either way, it's going to be a heck of a blockbuster. I think it's going to be physical as shit. Both forward packs with no regard for their body. There's going to be some massive collisions and hopefully there's some points scored too. And she really is an entertaining spectacle with the referee. He's not as noticeable. No big calls that decide the outcome. Let's the players play and we get treated to one of the great Super Rugby finals. Shit. Can't wait for this one. Then before we wrap up your rugby chat, got to rip into my Surly Super Rugby Awards, of course. Last week I presented your nominees, asked you to vote. This week I've got the results, and fair to say it was a popular segment too. People firing through their thoughts, which I love to hear. So your nominees for your most improved was Harry Plummer, Xavier Newmere, Billy Proctor, and Lotu Anisi. The winner for this category goes to the bloke I just harped on about in the 10 for the Blues outstanding this year his games developed in leaps and bounds it is the tradie Harry Plummer your breakout player of the year nominees for this one was Braden Yossi Wallace Satiti and Peter Lakai and I thought Satiti might have pulled this one off with the recency bias and his performance over the last couple of weeks, but the winner was actually the Wellington Seven in Peter Luckey, and this was a real tight one, not many votes splitting them, and you could say all three were deserved winners in this category. You could argue the other two lads were pretty unlucky not to win, but what a season from him, scored a nice try in that semi-final when they lost Artie for this year, everyone thought there was going to be a massive void, but almost Artie too 2.0, Peter Luckey stepped up and he might have played his way into an All Blacks jersey or at least into an All Blacks squad, maybe for that end of year tour in that apprentice type role. So well done to him. And then the big award, your MVP nominees were D-Mac, Hoskins, Sevu and Asafo Amua. Your winner, and I've already blown his trumpet enough so I won't lick his balls too much more. D-Mac, he comes away with the chocolates. Best player in the comp this year. Hard to argue with that. Can he add a winner's championship medal to the prestigious Surly Super Rugby Player of the Year award? We'll see. About 9 o'clock Saturday night. Can't wait. And up the Chiefs' mana. I'm riding with them for this final get-up shooter. And hopefully an invite to kick-ons. Weekly wrap time, look to pump this one out because again, the potty, your Super Rugby, your NRL really did consume a lot of time there. Celtics, champs, been the best team all year, deserved NBA winners here. 4-1, smoked the Mavs in a pretty one-sided series to be fair. And overall, I actually thought these NBA finals were pretty disappointing. The West had some good matchups, but the East and the Celtics, they were just way too good and marched their way through fairly easily. A bit of controversy, Jalen Brown winning the MVP over Jason Tatum, which did surprise me because Tatum, he's been their best player all year and often they just give it to the best player regardless of form throughout the finals. JB, he probably had the better playoffs and the better series, but all money was on Tatum to bank that one and no doubt that stings for him a little. I think he'll come back next year with a bit of a chip on his shoulder, although he's been celebrating the chip in a major way and him and Brown have been saying 
saying that they both deserved it. It was a co-MVP. And the Celtics in general, they look like a really connected team, which was bloody cool to see. But I do think this will sting a little for Tatum, and I expect him to come out next year and back up this season with another big shift. So keep your eyes out for that one. It was the first banner for the Celtics since 2008. Great to see Tatum and Brown win one alongside as well Al Horford, who certainly deserves one. Their 18th title as a franchise, Boston, just proved way too strong. Disappointing for the Mavs, mainly so in the performance of Kyrie Irving. I thought Luca was great, and I got some stats for you here too, because he can certainly hold his head high. In terms of your NBA playoff leaders across your main stats for your categories throughout these playoffs, your points leader was Luca, your rebounds leader was Luca, your assist leader was Luca, steals leader, no surprises, Luca. Blocks leader, Daniel Gafford. So it's always great to have some work ons, and hopefully, Luca, he'll be practicing swatting away shots in this offseason. Leader in deflections, Luca. Three point shooting, Luca. Double doubles, Luca. Triple doubles, Luca. So it's fair to say the buck doesn't stop with him. He won't be copping any blame for Dallas not getting the job done. Was disappointed to not see this series drag on a little and go to seven. But at the same time, Boston just so good this year. They only dropped three playoff games throughout this whole finals. An elite side that deserves all the accolades they're getting. And well done to them. US Open, Rory, bed shit. Gives it to Bryson. The putter had been on song all day, but McElroy, when he needed it the most, it just deserted him at the end. He turned into two putt Shakur, missing some very, very run of the mill putts for him. Fair to say he didn't hang around long after either to watch Bryson lift the trophy. Gapped it pretty quick in disappointment. And fair enough, too, he's only human. Pull pin from his next tournament. I think he said he'll be at the Scottish Open. He's skipping the next one. So clearly that one hurt. Bryson, though pulled off that beautiful up and down on 18 55 yards out out of the bunker set her up dropped her four foot from the pin to get the win one of the more exciting finishes to a US Open that I can remember certainly one that had bums on seats and it lit up social media which is bloody good for the golfing world then quickly black caps gone t20 world cup Really disappointing stuff. Losing to Afghanistan and the West Indies, then pumping Uganda and PNG, but we were already out of contention. Real consolation wins there. Disappointing scenes. We won't be playing for the chocolates. And it looks like your Aussies, your Indias, well and truly in the box seat now to go on and win this one. So tough shit there. Will there be changes in the coaching hierarchy? I think there were a couple interesting decisions around selections, game plan, not playing warm up games. Someone's head has to roll in my opinion for them would love to see a Brendan McCullum or someone come back and lead this team into the future because I think the current setup isn't working changes are needed and hopefully they come over the next couple of months Time now for your punting chat, brought to you of course by our great mates at the TAB, they're the headline sponsor of this pod, you already know the drill, but if you are having a flutter this weekend, make sure you do it through the TAB, there's promos, boosted options, power plays galore, of course NRL will kick her off there, first game Tomorrow night, full fizz Friday, Finns taking on the Storm. Finns, underdogs at home, 265. Bellamy's boys, your favourites, at $1.48. The Storm, they've won nine of their last ten games that Jerome Hughes has played in. The headgear assassin, what a menace he is. Dolphins winger Jack Bostock, he scored ten tries in his last 11 games. Storm centre, Nick Meaney, any Meaney, 62 points in his last four games. He's in some great form. Wayne Bennett. He's lost his last 11 games to the Melbourne Storm. So fair to say, regardless of who he's coaching, they've been a real bogey side for him. So I'm going Storm, Intermini and Bostock here as my same game multi. Looking for a bit of juice on your Friday night. So fingers crossed that one comes through. Then Super Saturday, Titans versus Waz. Wars favourites, $1.53, all is right again in the gambling world after we started the week 
underdogs over the last couple of weeks. But Titans here, they've won four of their last five games against the Warriors, which is a bit of a worrying stat. But Sean Johnson, he's won 18 of his 21 games against the Titans. Loves playing them, loves going to the Goldie. So I'm confident the boys will get the chocolates and SJ will add another tick to that box. The Titans, they've also only won one of their six games at home this season. Alofiana Khan Pereira, he scored 12 tries in his last 15 games at Seabus Super Stadium. But for me, of course, I'm going Warriors here. You always know I'll back the boys regardless of who we are taking on. Your try scorer markets, though, that is where things get interesting. And I still can't get away from Marata Neil Kore on an edge at $5.50. Didn't score last week, but went oh so close a couple times and five. $5.50, that has to be overs. I like RTS, back from a hammy, looking to impress at $2.85. And I also like Chance Nickel Clockstard, first, second, or third try scorer at $5.40. And Adam Fenua Blake, the same option, first, second, or third at 6 bucks is also appealing. My surly boost for this week is Warriors to win and Chance to salute first, second, or third. That's been boosted up from $6.11 to $7.50 of the best. So get on board that. And again, really appreciate everyone's support on that bet. Roosters versus Dogs. These odds, they surprise me a little. Roosters $1.36. Doggies $3.15 head to head. The Roosters have won nine of their last 11 against the Bulldogs. So I understand it from that historical matchup. But of course, the Bulldogs bet them earlier on in the year. And they're on a nice little win streak too, chasing four straight wins for their first time since 2019. The Roosters captain, James Tedesco, he scored 11 tries in 11 games against the Dogs. So he's a great shout for an anytime try scorer. For me, in this one, a same game multi is going to be either team, 12 and a half or under winners. Then I like Teddy and Joshy Curran. Nice multi there, $10.93. Pretty juicy stuff. And I think Viliami Kikau, named on an extended bench, if he comes into this football side, wouldn't mind having a cheeky lick on the dogs, a confident football side at the moment. They are missing Critter, their inspirational captain, so I'm sure that will hurt them. But $3.15, not the worst odds for Doggies fans out there. Bunnies Manly, like the Bunnies in this one, they're $1.46 favourites. Manly, $2.75. The Rabbitohs, they've won seven of their last eight games against the Gulls, and Manly haven't defeated the Bunnies at a core since 2013. The Gulls, they've not won consecutive times against the Rabbitohs since 2010 either. Of course, bet them over in Vegas. So all stats suggest here to get on board the South Sydney lads. The Rabbitohs have scored 110 points in their last three games. They've shot themselves into form. AJ, he scored 15 tries in 16 games against the Manly Seagulls, and he's now the second greatest try scorer in NRL history. So for me, Bunnies win here. Jack Wyden at 285 is a good shout. Keon Colin Matangi at 315. Playing lock is also a good bet. And then for Manly, I like Ben Travojevic, who continues to improve week in and week out, paying $4.40. A cheeky little second rower bet there at some juicy odds. Super Sunday. Tigers Raiders, like I said, poo slinger. This one's one for the purists, so strap yourself in. Tigers 235, Raiders $1.60. The Tigers, they haven't defeated the milk at home in a decade, so it's been unlucky hunting for them. The Raiders, they won their last eight straight against the Tigers. Justin Ollum, he scored five tries in the Tigers, three wins this season, so if he scores, that's a good omen for them. Jordan Rapana, he scored 16 tries and 14 games against the Tigers and he's in some great form so far this year. The Tigers, they've lost their last 10 games at home too. Time they changed their home ground. So I'm going Raiders into Olam and Raps here. $9.80 for a nice little same game multi to round out your NRL action. Then I've also thrown together a four leg Oval ball, mega multi buster. Just because of those buy games, I like having multiple investments in your rugby league. This gives us another option, of course. If it misses buy a leg, we'll get my money back as bonus cash too. I've gone Storm, Warriors, Bunnies, Raiders, all head to head, $5.28. Fingers crossed that comes in. 
at some decent odds would be a nice way to round out your rugby league week. Then in the Super Rugby, Blues dollar fifty favourites, Chiefs two dollars forty five for your Super Rugby final. The line is set at minus four and a half in favour of the Blues, and the total points fifty four and a half. In terms of your winning margins, the Blues one to twelve. That's your best back at two dollars forty five. Blues thirteen plus at three dollars thirty, and that's interesting to me because the Chiefs one to twelve is paying the same odds. So people think that's as likely. Blues 13 plus as the Chiefs getting the win 1 to 12. I find that a little out the gate. Then Chiefs 13 plus. $7.50 appears no one's jumping on a big score from them for your stats. The Blues have won four out of the last five meetings between these two sides. Also, in the last five games, the home side has won 80% of them. And interestingly, the team who scores first has won 80% of the time too. So fast starters needed from both teams. They both got it in the semi-final. Can they turn it on early doors? Whoever scores first, that'll give you a great indication as to which team will go on to win this game. For me, I think your tried and trusty try bet is the best option here. Love that. Go on it almost every week in your derby games. You all know that. Either team wins by under 7.5 points, paying $2.45. I think that is pretty decent money. Then, if you want to take your fence sitting out of it, pick a team and ride them home. I'm going Chiefs Manor, and I'm going them 1-12 to at $3.30. I think if you're backing the Chiefs you may as well get on them 1 to 12 extract the extra juice out of it because I can't see them going 13 plus take the odds a bit of a boost there an extra 90 odd cents and you bank it so I'm going Chiefs 1 to 12 going the try bet either team under seven and a half and then I'm also going Cortez Ratama to dot down I think he's going to have a big game up against Finlay Christie so I'd love to see him salute for your bet of the week I'm 12 out of 16 for these last week went the Warriors head to head and got no dice so this week I'm going that try bet as my bet of the week option either team wins by under seven and a half paying two dollars and 45 rugby union cents sign me up for that then for your magic multi going leery here of course as i always do swinging for the fence in hopes of a big win at some juicy odds gambling responsibly but still taking a chance nickel clock start at pulling off a famous result just a two-legger for me here Chiefs 1-12 to into Adam Fanua Blake, first, second or third try scorer. Mentioned before I have chance in my boost, so here I'm hedging my bets. I think Adam could score early doors as well. Hopefully one of them does so we get green ticks on bet slips. A bit of insurance here. Those two legs, Chiefs 1-12 to into AFB, first, second or third, paying $21.08. Happy punting and get up the magic multi.